Hi, I'm Randall Heyman, a university mathematics academic. The coronavirus outbreak is impacting students learning all around the world, so I've rejigged my YouTube video, uh, YouTube channel uh, to make quick turnaround videos. So if your students or your child or your grandchild or you yourself have a mathematical problem, um, comment below the video or send me an email and I'll try and help. So this is part, this was going to now be, let's write it up here. We'll cross out part one and we'll put part two. This is part two where we go through the whole process of showing that any integral domain can be embedded in a quotient field. I'm going to be talking in terms of the integers rather than say in integral domain and fractions rather than the quotient field uh, because it makes it a little bit more real. Um, if you want to follow along, I'm sort of following Freilich section 21 as asked by the viewer who suggested this. Um, but if you'd like, I'll put a link to a PDF uh, below the video and you can click on that and it shows you similar sort of a similar sort of thing. Okay, so we're defining what fractions are to be. So you can almost imagine that you're go back in history to think about this whole concept of fractions and all we're really doing is formalizing what, what, what fractions are. So the first thing we could do is that we could say that we'll start by taking the, this is called the Cartesian product. Oh, it's not, oh, it's not the integers it's like that, is it? It's like this. What we do is we take the integers. This is the set of integers times the set of integers. So this is the, it's called the Cartesian product. And all that means is that we create a set which contains all the ordered pairs A and B such that A is an element of Z and B is an element of Z. So example, three, two. 3 is an integer, 2 is an integer, and so this pair, this ordered pair, 3, 2, is one of the elements here. Okay, so that's good. Now, the next thing is we don't consider, um, we're going to be heading towards creating fractions, so this one would become 3 on 2. Uh, what we don't want is we don't want to zero down the bottom. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to not use that, we're going to use this. A, B, such that A is an element of Z. B is an element of Z. And B does not equal zero. And I'll just put another example here just to stress, we could have minus seven on six, we can have negatives. Okay, now we come to the first problem. Well, that's the first problem, the B equals zero. The second problem, which is the major thing here, which is, which we saw at school, is that this problem, Three on two equals six on four. This is a problem. And the way that we handle this is we want to, we want to set here where each element is different. Um, because in sets you can't have, um, I mean, you could have three and two and six on four. In fact, three, three, two, the ordered pair three, two and the ordered pair six, four are in this set. But the problem is they're exactly the same thing in terms of uh, how we use fractions. So we can't just leave it as is. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an equivalence class. Create. Equivalence classes. And we do that using an equivalence relation. Now, I do have a video called Equivalence Relations Made Easy. If you don't understand it, I suggest you have a look at that and then come back to this video. If I remember, I'll put a link up here so you can just click through. So what we do is we just say that um, a, the ordered pair AB is equivalent to CD if, so this is saying that there's an equivalence relationship between the two. And we know the, the way we can think about it. This, these are two, uh, the same because three times four is the same as six times two. So 
uh, A times D equals B C. Okay, and now, well, the first thing that we should do is show that this is in fact an equivalence uh, relation. And there are three steps to show that, so for an equivalence relation, to be able to actually call this an equivalence relation, we need to show uh, reflexivity, reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. And you'll see that on my video. But if you don't want to get involved in all that, <clears throat> what I'm basically, what we're basically doing is is just <clears throat> setting it up so that <clears throat> once it's an equivalence relation, we know that there's a whole lot of rules that we can use, and everything sort of behaves nicely in terms of mathematics. So it's important that we establish that. So um, I'm not going to do the proof uh, of all of those things. We'll take it as given that it is an equivalence relation. Now the thing is, um, and this is um, this is where the notation gets messy. Um, so what we'll do is we'll we'll use this notation to notate the equivalence class. Class containing the ordered pair A B. So, if you like, you could think of this like a set. It's a set that contains all of the things that are equivalent to A B. So, what we now really should do is we should go back and create this new set. So, so the fractions. will be the set and now rather than putting a b we put the equivalence class and b does not equal zero so this is just the set of fractions but what we've now ensured is if we're actually going to write this out, obviously we'd have a whole lot of fractions. I can't, there's no, I can't uh, put them in strict order if you like, but so we'd have three on two um, and then uh, whatever, five on four, uh, seven on th six, whatever we, there's no great order. We just got a whole lot of them. But if we had six on four under the old system, we would have six and on four and three on two were, were in this set. And, this, and they're regarded as being different. Now what we're doing under this system, we're getting rid of the six on the four. That six on four is now just included with this. So this three on two is now the equivalence class containing the ordered pair three, two, or the fraction three on two. Okay, so I think that's all we need to do with step one. We have now created uh, this system called fractions. Well, we've created a set. What we need to do to move forward next is to define the two operations of addition and multiplication. So that's what I'll do in the next video. If you've got any questions on this or any aspect of mathematics at all, including a high school or even down to primary school, uh, leave me a comment below.